we have a here at Purdue we have an EPA star thanks Ned uh, project and also uh, EPA um, national priority and I'm on the WORF one that um, Dr. Beecher just was talking about. So on the STAR, we're kind of looking at treatment to reduce the PFAS loads within a wastewater facility. Um, and so including, you know, looking, uh, yeah, so we're just looking at that. And then we're also looking at what happens in the anaerobic and aerobic process and the possibility of pyrolyzing heavily contaminated biosolids, ones that have high PFAS loads, as a way to reduce PFAS leaching without, um, you know, stuffing them in a landfill. And I will just uh, say that, um, let me just skip to this, that so for this, you know, we had a biosolid that had, you know, several hundred PPB of um, PFAS, and <clears throat> the poor water concentrations were in the six to 1,200 parts per trillion for individual PFAS is very high. But once we pyrolyzed this, even at a low temperature, low oxygen, nothing came out after that. I mean, the most we saw of the very shortest chain was like five parts per trillion, which is well below any levels of concern. And so um, we're also looking to see if biosol this biochar can store PFASs from regular um, biosolids just as a, as a management practice. And lastly, um, we have this national priorities where we're going to be focusing on mostly Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Virginia, where we have yield sites or we'll be using the uh, you know, well, uh, rural water well network um, in Pennsylvania. We don't really have one of those in Indiana, but our goal of this overall project is to try to understand how much um, land application of biosolids and other agricultural operations really contribute to the total PFAS load that might be present in groundwater. As Ned said, we don't think that the average biosolid um, that has not been industrially impact, heavily industrially impacted is actually causing major concerns in groundwater, but we need data to prove it. Um, and we have some, you know, historical data that we, you know, are looking at, but now we're going to be conducting new work. And there's two other projects that were funded. You can go to that site and look at that. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, when we're thinking about regulations, I guess we want to kind of close with this. I get, like I said, I get asked, these are forever chemicals. Shouldn't we just ban anything with them from being land applied? Well, that's really not realistic. It creates a lot of heavy burden on public municipalities, which we pay the taxes for, and the people that will be hurt most will be people that can't afford the taxes to begin with, and that's just the start. Um, so there's a lot of unintended consequences. Some of the things that Ned was talking about, how close levels are getting to, you know, even just background soil levels, well, that means every homeowner then can be suspect for when they try to sell their homes, you know. So this is why regulatory decisions have to be made with a, a big, you know, open lenses, so to speak. Um, we want to control sources. Michigan's doing really good to now identify industry and landfills, um, larger landfills that might be contributing a lot of PFASs to the treatment plant, getting them to pre-treat like in the days of metals which totally solved our metals problem in biosolids. Um, get rid of, I work really hard to help get rid of non-essential uses of PFAS. That data I showed you for composted city waste, not biosolids, that was used in the state of Washington to develop bills to uh, remove PFAS-containing packaging by. Hopefully it will happen this year. So they had to prove that um, they couldn't, you know, they had to prove that they couldn't find anything better um, or else, by, I guess, January next year, no more no more PFAS food packaging in the state of Washington, which will then trickle down to other states. And I've also done some work with California. So, you know, so we just generally say let's move really fast to get rid of non-essential uses of PFAS, which includes a lot of things, even aqueous film forming foams at this point, and let's work slow to come up with regulations and provisional values that are protective of human health without causing a lot of stress is what I call it, non unintended consequences. And then we can just be winners. So that's kind of, I think, Ned and both Ned and our take home message. And in between, lots of research needs to happen. I'd like to always to end with stressing the fact that uh, we can address this issue through phasing out and, and reducing use of non-essential uses, as Dr. Lee mentioned. Um, the most significant reduction of risk and PFAS levels that has occurred, and including the levels in human bodies, has been the voluntary phase out that EPA facilitated for PFOA and PFOS. And our blood serum levels have been reduced by 70% over the last 20 years. So let's take that as, as a roadmap and uh, control things at the source, uh, reduce the most concerning PFAS um, in that way. 
So that is uh, what we had. We appreciate your time.